What's the appetite for a new party, the sustainability, the plausibility of it, Andrew? Well, there's a, there is certainly a need in the country because there is a growing group of people, because of the Labour Party has chosen to fudge Brexit rather than to be the Remain Party, and because the rotation of the underlying kind of demographic structure of politics is, is, is essentially creating a new divide which is open versus closed, to use Tony Blair's language, there isn't really a credible mainstream party of open. About two-thirds of people, if you ask them in a poll, say, I don't feel there's any party that represents my values. I think I would like to see a new party. Um, so Does that mean we get one? Or does that, are there other forces well, that will stop that actually I, happening? I, I, my own view is we will get at least one. Uh, will it thrive? Whether it thrives is a whole other question. Obviously, the first past the post system is extremely unforgiving mm. for, for, for a new party and for a party that's vote is fairly evenly distributed and for a party that doesn't have a very an asymmetrical support with a very strong regional base of support as it's the a killer. Two, two main parties do. It is a killer. Uh, I think you know my first my first job from university was working for the STP. Um, so. Um, you got form. I got form. I've, I've, and I, I've, I think I think actually there are some some important differences from that period. Firstly, the the underlying class structure of politics is substantially broken down. The extent to which you know ABC ones overwhelmingly Tories, C2DEs overwhelmingly Labour ceased to be true. Um, secondly, actually, the, the the general loss of faith in politics and in the political system and in all the parties and the increasing volatility of the electorate over the last 30 or 40 years, fewer and fewer people habitually voting for the same party you know, over and over again, and more and more churn within and between elections, means that potentially there are more people who are, who are biddable, more people who are gettable for a new party. And actually the Brexit process, has, for many people, is, is the sort of final capstone on the total failure of our British political system. A view that, 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 that they've, they've made such a mess of this and done it in such a childish, irresponsible, dishonest way, it's the last straw for lots of people. So I think, I think the opportunity for a new party that could, could harvest that is, is significant. Mm -hmm. However, the immutability of the first past the post system you know, means probably one wouldn't bet on it succeeding. But, but a party of the m moderate elite, centrist elite, when there seems to be a bit of an uprising out there against the centrist elite. Is that really a project, Gavin, you think I, could I, take off? I think, uh, it, it, well, I would be surprised if something doesn't happen what, in terms of, you know, I, th I, I don't, I have no Some time time, But I would be very surprised. If you're saying in the, if we had this conversation in a year's time, do I, would I expect there will be some form of, of fracturing at the very, at the edges of the Labour Party in terms of some M MPs making some sort of move either towards a new party or some degree of greater autonomy from the current leadership, I think that probably is quite likely. But I also, the bigger point I would say is I think that's likely to be very small scale. I think it'll get a huge amount of attention because it will be a big deal in British politics, clearly. But I think it's, I, if you're asking, do I see a mass breakaway? The answer to that is emphatically, I don't. Um, and I think it is partly because of the kind of big beast of fix, you know, first past the post, which just sort of is this great big roadblock. I also, I mean, I don't want to get lost in the dark days of the early 1980s, um, but, you know, I think... And Andrew's getting flashbacks. And Andrew's getting flashbacks, <laughs> and I, that wasn't, you know, I wasn't there. But, and, and, and Andrew, I think I agree, actually, that in some ways there is more fluidity than there was then. Um, but also, on the other hand, you know, you had four of the biggest beasts in British politics then who led this thing, and there's absolutely no way that you're going to see the, the equivalent political heft and leadership, in, in my view, behind the new party right, right now in this country. And does it actually need political leadership? Would it actually need people from outside politics to capture the imagination and give it a sense of novelty, rather than it looking like some B-celeb politicians? Andrew? I, I think it would certainly need to feel that it came from outside and it, it was a sort of people's movement, as it were. It realistically, it needs some politicians there as well. But um, at the moment, such as the distaste and contempt for all the politicians and all parties, not being formed by people who are leading figures in the current broken system is perhaps arguably a positive for it. But I, I also think, I mean, I suppose the, the, the tension in British politics at the moment is on the one hand, there was this kind of new identity cleavage around the Brexit issue, which is a proxy for all sorts of other things about your values and how, how, who you identify with and your approach towards social liberalism, internationalism, all sorts yeah. of other things that Andrew has talked about. But I also think there is still 
a kind of residual but quite deep attachment amongst large swathes of the population to those great big beasts called political parties to which they have some identity with. Now that's changing the buckets of people, if you like, who who kind of identify with those different parties it's have dwindling. changed. A is dwindling and B has changed over time according so to class and demographics. Like my ex-mining constituencies where people have ended up voting Tory even though they were on the minor strike. So there has been some of that change and that's important and we are seeing that and I think the Brexit process has, if you like, quickened a kind of expedited an underlying shift in that direction that we had been seeing. But on the other hand, the idea that I think people are just kind of fully fluid to move to new parties and move away from those things is not one I buy. I think there is still, there are other divides or kind of divisions within Britain, you know, your view on the state and redistribution and traditional, if you like, 20th century politics, which I still think has a hold on people. And so in some sense, we kind of feel stuck, I think, between the new big division that we are talking about currently around Brexit and the things that that is a proxy for and more traditional things which I think are still there and still cast a shadow over, over our politics and I don't think are about to melt away that kind of holds the, the form of politics that we're familiar with together in addition to the fact that we have this electoral system which is incredibly punishing of change and I think that for me makes it feel likely that when this conversation in a year or two's time we'll still be talking about the same basic party structure with a bit of change at the edges. And two parties that decided in the end they had to back Brexit, even though half the country or close to it didn't vote for it. That not one of them going to end up migrating towards a different position, or will those identities just fall away? That's well, I mean, what we don't know, what is not knowable currently, is how long does do the dividing lines of Brexit stay dominating the political bloodstream of the country. My view is that they're here to stay. My view is actually you can see the slow sort of burn of those values rising to the surface long before Brexit. And Brexit was sort of turbocharged them and brought them to the surface. But actually, if you look around the world at other countries, where essentially the same factors are disrupting politics. Culture wars of the kind. Right? And, and you know, the, the, the drivers of Trump are exactly the same as the drivers of Brexit. And of the, you know, the AFD in, in Germany and in the Front National in France. And actually, in most countries, what's happening is either the established centre right and centre left parties shift to sort of occupy the territory of open and closed, or they get replaced by new parties that do, which is what's happened in, in what happened in the Austrian presidential election, happened in the French election. Uh, we can see it now happening in in Germany. It's what happened in in America. The, the, in America, the the Republican Party now, but you know, it, it, Trump winning was the completion of a trend that started in the late 1990s with the average Republican voter becoming progressively poorer, less well-educated, less healthy, and even less diverse in a country becoming rapidly more diverse and the Democrats becoming steadily wealthier, better educated, more metropolitan. Um, that's essentially the trend which we're seeing. So in the 2017 election, um, the two things which defined it were firstly that the, the Conservative vote only went up in parts of the country that voted for Brexit, predominantly in traditionally uh, Labour working class parts of the country, not quite enough of an increase in votes to win them many seats, but nevertheless an in increase in support, and they lost support and Labour gained seats in the bits of Britain that voted Remain, particularly Greater London. Um, the other hugely significant thing, which I think is part of this, which was um, defined the 2017 election, was the massive swing from Conservative to Labour among 25 to 45 year olds. And that is driven by values, because beneath this sort of cultural values divide between Remain and Leave, there's a massive generational factor. Now, we, 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 we all noted that in the, in the referendum in 2016, you know, basically old people voted to, to leave and younger people voted to remain. But that same divide is there when you look at the underlying fact issues, you know, people's views on nationalism or internationalism, on globalisation, on social liberalism, on immigration, on multiculturalism. If we're boiling it down, people, that open, closed thing is, is a lot about people who are um, comfortable with the way the yes. world is it's changing what, and people who are nervous, hostile. Yeah. It's what so social scientists would, would call a cohort effect. It's basically about the, the, the different reactions of different generations to the same shared experiences that they've lived through. Um, so, you know, in 2017, 
at the general election. Labour won among under 45s, the Tories among over 45s, but it wasn't a sort of gradual curve through the age groups. Labour won by 35% among under 45s, and the Tories won by 30% among over 45s. Now, that sitting beneath that is a set of, of cultural and, val and values factors, and I think the thing which does perhaps point to a longer term, more fundamental restructuring of British politics is that generational divide, because unless there's a party that really sort of stands on and speaks to those core open values that are overwhelmingly held by younger people, um, that th the gap gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, I yeah. think on the, on the question as to the sort of stability of the current setup in terms of the positions of the parties and whether the electorate is that, I think the thing that feels unstable is that you do, given this divide that Andrew's talked about, over the medium term have two parties who are basically comfortable with the fact that Britain has left, yeah. if assuming Britain has left, and is somehow outside of the kind of the realm of the European Union. I, I don't see that. I do think the structural force within the Labour Party of the Labour Party membership holding the views that they do and the age that they are at means that when you think about what happens in the next leadership contest in the Labour Party, goodness knows who's going to win that campaign. I've literally no idea. But what I feel more confident about is Lemon that... Lemon told us it should be a woman. Well, that's a jolly good thing too, if you ask me. But he's, got, whoever, he's, got, he's got one very big vote. But <laughs> whoever that per, those people are standing for that, I'd be willing to wager that there will be different shades of one thing, which is a strong position that the country's destiny is, is closely allied with the European Union and probably inside it in one form or other. Um, now, whether the people saying that are desperate to hold a referendum or whatever it is to take us back in quickly, but or, whether, the or whether they, they think wear. it's it'll, it'll be the clothes they wear. Now, th I think there would probably be genuine divisions between those who actually really think that they want to run on that because they want to do it in office, that too. and those who think a bit like David Cameron, perhaps you know, in terms of how he managed his party, which is. I, I'll need to manage these people. I need to say the things I need to say. I, it'll probably never happen, except you, for you it did. You, um, but uh, you know, but you need to assume a position of where to close. You but are I telling us Brexit never leaves us, aren't you? I think Brexit is is going to be in one form or other with us for as long as I'm going to be talking about British politics, which is probably quite a long time. You're but not, I, I, you're I don't see. Angry. I don't see. I see different versions of it being with us, different scenarios, but I don't see it melting away. In political terms, there's no such thing as post-Brexit. It will define us, I think, for the rest of our lives. There was a fascinating piece of research published before Christmas, uh, Professor John Curtis um, published, which showed that, that people now overwhelmingly identify their own political views by reference to their 2016 referendum vote. 77% of people either very strongly or strongly identify politically as either a Remainer or as a Lever. And that's much stronger than the numbers for identifying as Labour. Yeah, more than twice. Only 37% of people strongly or very strongly identify with any party. But, this, but Europe, I mean, this goes back to the point you're making, was not a topic anybody said when you knocked on the door and said, what are the top 10 issues that are most important to you? Before the referendum, it just never came anywhere. It was immigration, tax, or whatever. Um, never. But so I'm saying, for, so for most people, for some people, some people who are neurotic about the EU as an issue, but most people, it's the they, they understood the Brexit referendum to be a proxy vote about lots of deeper values and about how they feel about the changes in the modern world, particularly immigration, multiculturalism, diversity, and the, and the impact of globalisation, but the social and cultural change that has stemmed from that. And by and large, if you're under the age of 45, that's the only reality you've ever known, and you grew up in a post-Cold War world, you, will, you regard those developments as positive ones in the world. And if you're 20 or 30 years older, by and large, you feel much more economically vulnerable and culturally threatened by them, and, you're, and you think they're negative. And when I say that to people, people often say, oh, that's a very London metropolitan view, but actually it, it isn't. And if you look at the age divide, it applies as starkly in every single region of this country, um, which is why I think it's going to continue to define us even further. And the other thing Gavin rightly said earlier is, is the thing about this is you can't actually fudge it in the end because you can't be a party of open values and a party of closed values. You can't be a party of Brexit and a party of Remain. So if that is going to be the, essentially the dividing line, the, those values, you have to pick a side. And, and, and the Labour Party under Corbyn sort of got away with fudging it in 2017, but, but, but partly because... Well, probably mo mostly, actually, because the consensus was there was no chance whatsoever of him winning, and therefore 
people projected onto him that he was the anti-Brexit pers Brexit person and voted for him. But actually, you know, people can, you know, open values people can tell when you're sending closed value signals and vice versa. So the 2022 election, if that's when we get the next general election, will be dominated by the rippling effects, mm. the long tail of Brexit, I, I, and I the one after that, and the I, one, and after the one after that. In different, in different guises, but as I say, mm. the form that takes is, is kind of totally up for grabs in a sense. So, you know, if we are, if we are kind of choose as a country for whatever happens over the next few months and years to be kind of completely outside, if you like, of the regulatory orbit of this regulatory superpower called the European Union, and we're outside that, then I think we will be in a permanent state of negotiation with that superpower about how much access from a very diminished position we may get. And that negotiation isn't going to have an end point in a date sometime soon. That is a, a rolling negotiation that we will be taking part in. Switzerland shows us we can be quite close and still be in a rolling negotiation. Exactly. And that isn't going to go away. And that will be a big deal for our economy and for jobs and livelihoods and politics will have to reflect that. On the other hand, if we actually choose to prioritise some form of regulatory alignment, so we're very close to that superpower. So that's, that's the choice we make, and that will have consequences for other things. But if that is the choice that the government and potentially the, the Labour Party too, together, ultimately make, then there'll be another form of conversation debate about Brexit, which is one of agitation, which is we never really left. And we are still, you know, de facto in this thing. And did you not hear us last time? And there'll be a, that, that will be a big dynamic in our politics. But So there will be a dynamic play, playing out in our politics, I think, but it could take very different forms, and we don't know yet which of those forms it will take. The, some of the people who led the Leave campaign, who Donald Tusk was trying to cast for a very hot location uh, this week, they wanted, their passion was a smaller state. Their repugnance at Europe was driven in some ways by thinking that it was, a, it was the monster state, the Leviathan. Um, but the people they led, in some cases, were people who wanted more spending, and they managed to play that ambiguity. Where, where does all, in the campaign, obviously, with the numbers on the side of the bus, how, where does all that go? Are we, who, who wins that one? The people who wanted the smaller state, or some of the people who were behind them who actually wanted a bigger one, or will there actually well, that, not be I that mean, much money to have a bigger state? I mean, that, that there, you know, therein lies a, a whole other messy saga, because, because the mandate for, for the 52% vote leave is not meetable, because it means so many different things. The Leave campaign took a calculated and, in my view, deeply cynical decision consciously not to define what they meant by Leave, which they did partly because it was defining what, what independence meant in Scotland that, that um, got Alex Salmond unstuck. And they could have gone out and they could have put to the country their vision of Britain as Singapore off Europe and low tax, low regulation, but they didn't. They didn't ask for that mandate, and they don't have that mandate. And to try now to kind of reverse engineer that reality onto a country that actually almost, in a sense, voted for the opposite, which in many cases people were voting to be insulated from those sort of global economic forces, not exposed to them. Um, you know, the sense of betrayal among, among people who voted leave is going to be immense. And you know, another reason why Brexit is never going away is, is the underlying factors which caused people to conclude <coughs> that Brexit, that stopping free movement in particular, was going to fix the problems that in their lives are sadly going to discover that actually Brexit, if it happens, makes them worse. And so the underlying drivers and, and, and the, the extent to which for some people that, that was their feeling about, in effect, globalisation, but internationalism, immigration, diversity, multiculturalism, their own national identity, displaced in all of that. All of those issues are still there, and, and, and if anything, going to get worse. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, what impact do, do I think kind of Brexit could have on the political economy of the size of the states and debates around that in British politics? I mean, the one thing I would observe is since, since we had the vote, there's been a a clear direction of travel towards more people from different, whether from the left or from the right, I think it applies across both ends of the spectrum, making bigger demands of the state for what the state should be doing in the post-Brexit world, whether that's more spending on defence because Britain needs to sort of hold its own as an independent nation, or whether that's you know, spending more on multiplied regions or on training or on housing, you name it. I, you know, there's been plenty of people coming from different perspectives saying, because of Brexit, we now, now need to do more. I've seen very few people coming forward saying, because of Brexit, we now need to make these cuts 
to the size of a state or we need to take the state back from this area of activity. So that's kind of one big dynamic, which is I don't see a relationship just based on what I observe between the, between the fact that we are soon to leave the European Union as things stand and smaller demands in the state, I see the opposite dynamic being played out. On the other hand, if you believe, uh, and I think we should believe to some degree, that the kind of the body of opinion about what's likely to happen to economic growth over the next 10 years, of course it will all be, none of it will be exactly right, but it, the different people who have had the best go at doing that all point in one direction and they, you, they land in, you know, depending on the nature of the deal, if there is a deal that is struck, it will be somewhere between a kind of loss of GDP over a decade of between, I don't know, 2% and 7%, roughly speaking. Um, that translates into a very big fiscal hit. Now, we've already got lots of fiscal pressures in this country, which I could bang on about, but I won't. But on top of all the things we already have to face up to, that translates into the state getting a lot less tax revenue. So it just to do the same stuff let alone, that we do today. Let alone coping with the demographic time. Let, let alone demographics and so on. Mm -hmm. Just purely because of that effect, you will have to raise taxes or make very large cuts to public spending just because of that effect over the next 10 years. So on the one hand, I observe political pressures for the state to do more coming from both left and right. On the other hand, less money coming into less the money, you know, we can debate the precise scale of that, but less money coming in. So that setup points to a sort of 10 years of fiscal disappointment on top of lots of other pressures, which is another reason that we will in one way or another be talking about, well, Brexit will be affecting us even if we're not talking about it, and I think we will be talking about it. It's hanging over us, and that is a very big deal for, our, for, for all parties, uh, and never mind for citizens, of course. So who owns our near midterm future? Which of the two political forces? We're not sure there's a, in this discussion that there's much scope for a third party, though it might be born, it won't thrive necessarily. Which of the two parties, one of them, let's, on the basis of this analysis, one of them Brexit identifying you know, uh, identifying, and, and the Labour Party perhaps putting on some Remainer-ish uh, clothes to appeal to its base, a, a demand for more state spending but not much money coming in, who owns the future? Who's best placed? I think the, the sort of de when you look at the alignment between the demographics and the values, I think in the short term... Brexitizing rewards the Conservative Party, but in the medium term it, it, it kills them. Uh, and I said earlier, the, cro the crossover in voting in 2017 was roughly the age of 45 between Labour and Tory. Because that's driven by values, essentially the Tory party is on, on the wrong side of a huge, huge values gulf with people under the age of 45. And all historical analysis and sociological analysis says, by and large, people people retain their core values with them as they age. So other things being equal, in other words, the crossover in the next election will be 50, and the election after that will be 55, and the Tory party is literally running out of old people who have that world view and who take that view of Brexit. So I think, I think medium to long term, the open values party of this country, and I think there'll be one, will win and and you know, the probability is for the reasons that Gavin has said is that that will be a a, a Labour Party that has that has grown and developed and is led by different people in a different direction. And you used to advise David Cameron on how to modernise the Conservative Party and take it in a direction that could try and scoop up those votes and yeah. things didn't I quite think it's very I mean it's end it, up where you would have wanted I often think it's quite interesting to look back. If if you told us well, I worked for David Cameron in um, number ten from the beginning of twenty eleven to the end of twenty thirteen, if you told us then at the next election in twenty fifteen UKIP will get twelve and a half percent of the vote, we would have been absolutely certain that we would be sitting in opposition. Now, David Cameron managed to carve out a coalition willing to vote for a mainstream, civilised, modern Conservative Party without the 12.5% of people who were obsessed with immigration and wanted to vote for UKIP. Uh, so I think, I think that the ostensible kind of mathematics, which seems logical to tour, is that their only, only kind of winning coalition is, is, to, is to encompass the UKIP bit of the world, I think is, is, is proven to be wrong. And what they're now living through is the fact that the more they do move in that direction in this political climate, the more that they drive away people who were more part of the mainstream and who David Cameron succeeded in winning over 
people who previously voted Liberal Democrat and previously voted Labour. Gavin, who owns the future? Well, I, I mean, it's a funny moment in time because you can make a sort of compelling case for what, why both parties have sort of sources of optimism and are simultaneously doomed. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're a Labour Party, you can depress yourself by just looking at the Conservative Party's capacity to appeal to people who vote in droves, older people, and your, your total failure, really, to reach those people. As a, you know, the Labour Party's performance amongst the over-60s is, uh, is incredibly weak, and that is just, in normal times, you would just sort of say that as a straightforward sort of, you know, you cannot win in Britain if that's the case. And that would be the sort of traditional view, I think. Um, however, you know, and Andrew is right that it, it, what's striking when, about the last election wasn't just that Labour did what it did in, amongst people in their 20s and early 30s, but it actually, you know, we're talking about people in their mid-40s. Yes. And that is incredibly telling. And any party who sees that swing against them, as the Conservatives did yeah. amongst voters in their kind of early to mid-40s, yeah. should be terrified. And so. when you look at the scale of the vote amongst the young... That is, you know, that you, you are storing up for yourself, you know, I mean, people use always, you know, existential problem, but that really is an existential challenge. So I think both parties should be absolutely terrified, and I think they are, about where they stand. I suppose the, thing, the point I would make is that, it, it, you know, we should all be a bit terrified, whatever you're, wherever you sit in this, because, um, without sounding too earnest in kind of this sort of conversation, that a lot of the challenges we face do require a party who is in power to have a coalition of support behind it yes. to allow it to do difficult things. And we can yeah. debate what the difficult things are, but, but you, need, you need a coalition which is broad enough to let you hold together and have the confidence to do difficult things when you're in power and to use your power for that purpose. And whether it's kind of how we're going to fix social care or how we're going to build the homes we need or whatever it is, you need to hold a coalition together. And it's incredibly hard to see how you do that if your coalition is just a really, really big one of people under 40 or a really big one of people 55 upwards. And that, for me, just looks like gridlock in terms of governing, and we cannot afford gridlock in this country. We couldn't afford it without Brexit, and we certainly can't afford it if we're given what we're likely to be about to be doing. Gavin Kelly, Andrew Cooper, we should all be terrified. What a thought on which to end. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts.